Hey everyone, welcome to Classic Cinema. 1952 was a decent but not great year for Hollywood. Television was becoming mainstream with people moving to the suburbs while the movie industry was battling McCarthyism. There were a few really fantastic films that year like Singing in the Rain. Just singing in the rain, what a glorious feeling. High Noon. The Quiet Man. And The Bad and the Beautiful. Today I will dive into 10 movies that I feel are underrated that I really like and to me have just flown under the radar. So sit back, relax, and go back in time to 1952. The first movie we will look at today is Pat and Mike, a romantic comedy starring the famous husband and wife team of Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn in their seventh film. The idea for the film came from another husband and wife duo, Ruth Gordon and Garson Kanan, screenwriters who were good friends with Tracy and Hepburn. They had also written Adam's Rib a few years earlier. Their goal was to showcase Hepburn's supreme athletic talents with golf and tennis. Hepburn performed all the sports scenes herself, no double required. Hepburn stars as Pat, a college phys ed teacher who competes in sporting events. Unfortunately, she crumbles whenever her fiance watches. Along comes Mike, Tracy's character, an underhanded sports promoter that weasels his way in as Pat's full-time manager. Fireworks ensue between Pat and Mike as they develop feelings for each other. What is it? What? What are you trying to needle me or something? I'm sure I don't. There's a sign, you know, no smoking. Where? I just put it up inside your head. The film has a simple story, but it's done in a way that has a natural flow. The acting is excellent, as you would expect with such a talented cast. There's not a lot of belly laughs, but the slow burn romance has plenty of arguing and witty banner. Be on the lookout for a young Chuck Connors in his debut, later known as the star of the Rifleman TV series, one of my favorite shows as a youngster. Also of note, Charles Bronson is in the cast in his second role credited as Charles Buczynski. One issue I had is Hepburn's age at filming. She was 45, a bit too old I believe for an up-and-coming sports star. If you enjoy light-hearted romantic comedies, then check out this forgotten gem. Yeah, there's one thing I gotta say though. What? Nicely packed, that kid. <laughs> is it that? The next film on the list at number 9 is Scaramouche, a romantic adventure movie done in Technicolor and directed by George Sidney. It stars Stuart Granger, Eleanor Parker, Mel Ferrer, and Janet Leigh. Scaramouche was originally meant to be a musical with Gene Kelly, Ava Gardner, and Elizabeth Taylor, but the MGM studio changed it. Based on the book by Raphael Sabatini in 1921, the story involves the evil Marquis de Maine, played by Ferrer, who kills the best friend of Andre Moreau, played by Granger, in a sword duel and steals his woman Aline, Janet Lee's character. Moreau begins plotting his revenge by posing as Scaramouche, a clown in an acting troupe while also training with a fencing instructor. When Moreau feels he's ready to challenge de Maine, he seeks him out to exact revenge and take back his love. You may turn your back on Scaramouche, my lord, but surely you will not run away from Andre Moreau. Scaramouche, you have given your last performance. This film has a wonderful mix of romance, action, and wit. Scaramouche is beautifully shot with rich colors, vibrant costumes, and outstanding detail. This film is mainly remembered for its eight minute long sword duel between Granger and Ferrer. 
It's quite spectacular. Granger took fencing lessons and did most of his stunts. The two actors practiced the routine for months to make it look more realistic. Although popular in its day, I feel it has fallen by the wayside. My dear child. I am not a child, nor am I a chattel. I'm a woman who wants to be loved for her own sake or not at all. This overlooked classic reminds us of a time before CGI effects when great action adventures could be done the old-fashioned way with hard work and lots of practice. If you love period costume swashbucklers, give Scaramouche a look-see. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Directed by renowned director Fritz Lang, Clash by Night comes in at number 8 today. This film noir drama stars Barbara Stanwyck, Robert Ryan, Paul Douglas, and Marilyn Monroe. Stanwyck plays Mae Doyle, who moves back to her hometown in California after an extramarital affair ends abruptly. She starts dating a fisherman named Jerry, played by Paul Douglas, while his best friend Earl, Robert Ryan's character, is also drawn to Mae. Mae gets bored after marrying Jerry and begins an affair to bad boy Earl. This movie has a bitter love triangle with lonely people searching for love. May, Stanwyck's character, is a female version of a typical noir male character. Cynical, disillusioned, down on her luck, and caught between two love interests. Monroe's character Peggy is dating May's brother. Her sex appeal is on full display here. You're strangling me! Who's exciting? Who's attractive? You. That's better. During filming, the famous nude calendar pics of Monroe came to light, and the set was swarmed by reporters, making filming difficult. All the actors give emotional performances and each show a complexity not often seen in these types of movies. Lang shows us it is easier to see flaws in someone else than yourself. Clash by Night is a very intense drama about betrayal and adultery. I'm surprised it doesn't get more attention. May. What do you really think of me? You impress me as a man who needs a new suit of clothes or a new love affair. But he doesn't know which. By no means is it a perfect film, but I think it's worthy enough to watch if you are a Barbara Stanwyck or Marilyn Monroe fan, or just a noir fan in general. Landing in at number 7 today is The Sound Barrier a drama about aviation directed by the great David Lean who went on to helm such classics as The Bridge on the River Kwai in 1957. I am the commanding officer of this camp. You British prisoners have been chosen to build a bridge across the River Kwai. If you work hard, you will be treated well. But if you do not work hard, you will be punished! Lawrence of Arabia in 1962. Come on, man! And Dr. Shivago in 1965. Wouldn't it have been lovely if we'd met before? I think we may go mad if we think about all that. I shall always think about it. The Sound Barrier is a fictional story about British pilots and engineers trying to break the sound barrier after World War II. The film stars Ralph Richardson, Anne Todd, who is David Lean's wife, John Justin, and Nigel Patrick. Lean accomplishes some amazing aerial photography and he gives the movie an almost documentary feel. He also does a credible job of capturing the spirit and hope of British ingenuity. In this film, wealthy John Ridgefield, played by Ralph Richardson, is trying to break the sound barrier with his aircraft company. He has lost his son during his quest and his daughter Susan, played by Ann Todd, is upset when her father handpicks a new test pilot, World War II ace Tony Garthway, Nigel Patrick's character, who is also Susan's husband. However, Ridgefield is steadfast in his goal to further science and aviation, no matter the cost. The script was nominated for an Oscar with a riveting story that has many thrills along with drama and heartbreak. I'm sorry, I must go. No, no, don't go. Stay and talk. Don't, don't leave me alone. As you would expect with Lean, 
The sound barrier is expertly filmed as well as thrilling and very engaging. I think Lean's later well-known films overshadow this earlier movie, so I look at it as a hidden gem. If you enjoyed movies like The Right Stuff, then strap yourself in and enjoy the ride. Ivanhoe leaps in today at number 6. Richard Thorpe directed this British-American adventure romance epic that was shot in Technicolor. Ivanhoe stars Robert Taylor, Joan Fontaine, Elizabeth Taylor, and George Sanders. It was based on the 1819 historical novel by Sir Walter Scott. The story involves British knight Wilfred of Ivanhoe, played by Robert Taylor, going on a mission to rescue his beloved king, Richard the Lionheart, from kidnappers. On his quest, Ivanhoe must confront the power-mad Prince John, played by Guy Rolfe, who is also the king's brother, and a dangerous knight, Brian de Bois Gilbert, George Sanders' character. Two beautiful maidens, Rowena, played by Joan Fontaine, and Rebecca, played by a young Elizabeth Taylor, are also vying for his affection. Ivanhoe kind of feels like two movies in one. One part old school swashbuckler with action and sword fights, and one part historical epic with romance, huge sets, and top-notch talent. I wonder if 1938's The Adventures of Robin Hood wasn't such a huge success that this movie would have even been made. The music score by Miklos Rosa is superb and was nominated for an Oscar and a Golden Globe. <laughs> Ivanhoe was MGM's biggest earner that year and was one of the top four grossing films of 1952. Only one Saxon could ever fight like that. So Ivanhoe? Ivanhoe. Ivanhoe. I knew, I knew. Knew what, Rowena? That you were safe and that you were alive and that you loved me still. Robert Taylor is serviceable as Ivanhoe, but he's no Errol Flynn. I think the two women characters elevate this film. Elizabeth Taylor is stunning as Rebecca. Even though Ivanhoe has a lot of faults, it's still a worthy addition to your collection of swashbuckling epics. Based on A.B. Guthrie Jr.'s novel, the Big Sky is my number five movie today. Directed by the legendary Howard Hawks, this film stars Kirk Douglas, Dewey Martin, Arthur Honeycutt, and Elizabeth Threat. The story takes place in 1832 as two Kentucky pioneers played by Douglas and Martin join a trading party to go to the Pacific Northwest via the Missouri River from St. Louis to trade furs with the Blackfoot tribe. They find out quickly that the elements are the least of their problems. The Big Sky has kind of become a forgotten Hawks classic, but it's not quite up to the standard of his better westerns like Rio Bravo and Red River. Regardless, it was still nominated for two Oscars. The film does a credible job of displaying how difficult it was exploring the wilderness back then and how it was a daily challenge to survive. However, the adventure part of this movie is minor compared to the friendship between Douglas and Martin's characters. They go from a deep respect and admiration for each other, but that is shattered as a woman comes between them. Arthur Honeycutt is the highlight of the movie as Zeb Calloway, Dewey Martin's crusty trapper uncle. He narrates the story and is quite the character. Dog, if you don't take after your pappy, dog, Could if be you I don't. Take after my ma, <laughs> you talk too much, horse. Could be your right, though. <laughs> I'm getting you out of hooting holler time myself. Hawks also adds a touch of dark humor. Who's guy? Got what? The finger. What's a man gonna do without his finger? What do you want your finger for? Seth Calloway, didn't you tell me an engine can't go to heaven unless he's whole, didn't you? That's right, I did. Sure yes, did. sir, I heard you. Now, while it's not one of Hawk's best, I still enjoyed for the stunning vistas of the Grand Tetons National Park where it was filmed. It's a place I've been to several times and absolutely love it. To me, the big sky is very visually satisfying. Even though the entire movie takes place in a New York City hotel, Don't Bother to Knock is a riveting psychological noir drama directed by Roy Ward Baker. The film stars Richard Widmark, Marilyn Monroe, Jim Bacchus, and Anne Bancroft in her debut. Richard Widmark, who is one of my all-time favorite actors, plays pilot Jed Towers who is on the outs with his singer girlfriend Lynn, played by Anne Bancroft, in a New York hotel. 
After noticing the beautiful Nell Forbes, Monroe's character, Jed sets his sights on her thinking she is a woman of means. Unfortunately, she is a babysitter for little nine-year-old Bunny Jones, played by Donna Corcoran, who outs Nell's deception, unleashing a series of events that unearths Nell's mental instability. Don't Bother to Knock might be one of the best films of its time to handle mental health in a respectful manner. I can't figure you out. You, you, you're silk on one side and sandpaper on the other. I'll be any way you want me to be. Why? Why is it so important? Because I belong with you. Even though Widmark has top billing, I think the real star is Monroe, who gives a credible performance in her first co-starring role as a mentally deranged woman. I've never been a huge fan of her acting, but I have to give her major props for being believable and making you feel sympathetic. Donna Corcoran debuted in Angels in the Outfield the year before and does a wonderful job here. Don't Bother to Knock received mixed reviews upon release, but over time it has gained appreciation, especially for Marilyn's portrayal. If you've ever disputed Marilyn's acting ability, give it a try and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Swinging in at number three today is a romantic comedy directed by Howard Hawks. Monkey Business stars Cary Grant, Ginger Rogers, Marilyn Monroe, and Charles Coburn. It was Hawks and Grant's fifth film together. In Monkey Business, Cary Grant plays chemist Dr. Barnaby Fulton, who is trying to invent a fountain of youth formula for his company. When a research chimp mixes chemicals that achieve the formula, Barnaby tries it himself by accident. He begins to act like a teenager, taking his boss's booksum secretary Lois, played by Marilyn Monroe, along for the ride. Hilarious hijinks result when other people like Barnaby's wife Edwina, played by Ginger Rogers, tries the formula as well. Monkey Business is a fun, silly movie, but it has a paper-thin plot. By the way, whose lipstick is it? Uh, what's her name? You, you know, Oxy's secretary. Oh, you mean that little pin-up girl, huh? Very cute. Sort of, but half infant. <laughs> Not the half that's visible. I know I will probably catch a lot of flack for including this film on my list, but I think it's not as good as Hawk's earlier films like Bringing Up Baby and His Girl Friday, so I believe it is often overlooked. In my opinion, Grant and Monroe elevate the film, and if Monroe wasn't in it, it would probably be nearly forgotten, which would be a shame. Even Hawk said it wasn't one of his best. That being said, Monroe looks absolutely gorgeous, and Grant's brilliant comedic timing is on full display. Doc, that's awful high. Oh, no, not for me. Oh, everybody looking at me. I always marvel at Ginger Rogers' dancing prowess after she drinks the formula. Amazing. I feel it's a really underrated comedy that says some things about what it is to grow up. If you like light-hearted screwball comedies, and in the mood for something silly, then let Monkey Business make you feel like a kid again. Coming in hot off the press at number two today is Park Row, a film noir drama written, financed, produced, and directed by Samuel Fuller, who was a former New York reporter. The movie stars Gene Evans, Mary Welch, and Herbert Hayes. In Park Row, Gene Evans plays disillusioned reporter Phineas Mitchell, who works for the star on Park Row. He convinces his fellow newspaper cronies to help him start a new paper to compete with the disreputable star. All my life I've wanted to be what you are, a newspaper man. What you can do, I can't. What you need, I've got. What I dream about, you are. I've got a good steam press. I've got a little credit, the type foundry. I've got a little newsprint, I've got a little cash. I want to go into partnership, Mr. Mitchell. Mary Welch plays Charity Hackett, owner of the star, and she does everything she can to sabotage the upstart paper, even as her and Mitchell begin to fall for each other. You started a war, Hackett! A circulation war! And I'll finish it! Taking place in the late 19th century, the opening scene describes Park Row as the most famous newspaper street in the world where giants of journalism mix blood and ink. 
Park Row is probably one of the most passionate, idealistic, and honest movies I've seen. Being a reporter was in Fuller's blood and it comes out in this film. The characters mention with reverence such titans as Franklin, Pulitzer, and Horace Greeley. Park Row bombed at the box office in 1952, but over the years many people have come to regard it as a B-movie masterpiece. What's amazing is the amount of detail and love one man crammed into a movie made in only 14 days. It seems that this is Fuller's magnus opus, his own personal Citizen Kane. If you ever get a chance to watch it, please jump on it. Park Row is a combination of optimism, toughness, idealism and passion you're jealous of him and you've made it a personal newspaper war i can understand if you love him you and i both know you'll never get him you come from a great line of newspaper people but you you're not of our profession in the end this film is a tribute to what all newspapers should have been striving to be but now, they are becoming irrelevant. Angel Face takes the top spot today. A smoking hot film noir crime drama, it was directed by the great Otto Preminger. The movie stars Robert Mitchum, Gene Simmons, and Mona Freeman. Gene Simmons plays the beautiful Diane Tremaine, a rich young woman who enjoys toying with people. Despite her attractive looks and privileged upbringing, Diane has lots of sinister thoughts lurking beneath the surface. After the unexpected death of her stepmother, she sets her sights on Frank, Robert Mitchum's character. Frank begins to fall for her, but soon comes to realize that the unstable Diane might be more involved in her stepmother's death than he was led to believe. There's an interesting story behind the making of this movie. Howard Hughes, RKO's owner, hired Preminger and he shot it in only 18 days because that was all the time Gene Simmons had left on her contract. Hughes knew that Otto was hard on actresses and he had it out for Simmons. You hate that woman. Someday, somehow, you're going to hate her enough to kill her. One story is that the scene where Mitchum slaps the hysterical Simmons, Otto made him do it over and over. Mitchum, being Mitchum, walked over to Preminger and slapped him hard. Mitchum said, is that how you want me to do it, Otto? In my opinion, this is an excellent film noir melodrama. Mitchum is outstanding, and it seems he was meant for these types of movies. Simmons gives probably her best performance. Primager's crisp black and white photography really pops off the screen. You know, it would be fun to drive this clear to Mexico. Yeah. Why don't you do that sometime? Opinions seem to be divided on Angel Face. People either seem to love it and believe it is underrated and forgotten, or they think it's trash and one of the worst noirs ever made. I loved the dark tones due to how the main characters get hooked on sex and money. If she's trying to kill you, why does she turn on the gas in her own room first? To make it look as though somebody else were guilty. Is that what you do? Overall, Angel Face is a very exciting and smart thriller that deserves to be elevated among the best noirs ever made. Thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button. Also, if you've subscribed, click the little bell icon for notifications. I'd love to read your comments and have you share the video with your friends. I'd appreciate everyone's help in keeping this channel growing. Until next time. Hasta la vista, baby.